Um, yeah, Beth sent me her copy of her presentation. I, uh, we, we did a little of it yesterday and um, I saw the rest of it today. And boy, if I thought I knew anything about the general, she's got uh, a, quite a bit of material there that uh, was re really new. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of trains in general, the Civil War and all that. And uh, we were really thrilled, Carol and I, a number of years ago on vacation. And we uh, went through and uh, got to see the real general, which to me was just awe-inspiring to be in the room with the, the, the real train you see in all the movies. So uh, I'd like to turn over to Beth. I'm going to mute everybody. When I do uh, mute uh, everybody, Beth, you'll have to unmute uh, yourself because it does mute the, uh, the co-host. Uh, but uh, once Beth gets going there, there you go. So mm -hmm. I will turn it over to you. Great. Well, thank you all for joining. So let me just jump right in um, with a picture. I think, Jim, this may be very similar to the picture that you're sharing already of the general. And, and I should say, when Bill and I did the test uh, of the technology Thursday night, we did notice that there was some latency. So if it gets bad, um, you know, Bill will, will jump in and let me know. Um, but I'll, I'll try to manage that as we go along. So, um, Get to where I can see my notes a little bit better here. So I, I am not from this area. I grew up in Memphis and then lived in Nashville for seven years, moved to Atlanta in 1998, um, met my husband here and got married and we bought a house in Kennesaw in 2003. Um, and I had grown up knowing the Disney movie about the Great Locomotive Chase, but had not made the connection um, that that happened right here in Kennesaw. Um, and Interestingly enough, the, the museum in Kennesaw, where the general is housed, had closed in 2001 for a, a significant renovation, and it reopened in March of 2003, just a little bit before we moved up here. So it was kind of exciting that at the same time we moved to this area, um, the, the museum was brand new, everything was kind of shiny and, and new. Um, so it was a great time for us to just learn more about the general and um, you know get to experience having it right here in our in our neighborhood. When my kids were little, they went to mommy and me classes with my husband every week. Uh, so we we get a little bit used to just having it here, but um, it, it is kind of impressive, like you said, Bill, to to realize that you're in the same room as this locomotive um, that was, you know, part of this significant story. So just a little bit of what we'll talk about today. Um, just in case anyone isn't familiar with the story of the chase, we'll spend a little bit of time on it. And just to kind of level set, we'll mention some of the cities and some of the people that were involved in the chase later in the presentation. So just to make sure that we're we're all um, on the same page with, with those names. Um, then we'll talk about the Great Locomotive Chase and some of the other movies that have been made um, about these events. We'll look at what happened to the general from the time the war ended until it came to rest in Kennesaw. It didn't come to Kennesaw until 1972. Um, so we'll talk about what happened to it during those intervening years. And during those years, it did make appearances at um, several several places, including a few World's Fairs. So we'll, we'll look at a few pictures of that. And then I've got just some other memorabilia to show you. Um, and we'll talk just a little bit about the Texas too. So normally when we hear the story of the general, even though there were a few trains that were involved in the chase, the, the two that we don't really hear about are the general in Texas. Um, so we'll talk about where it is now because it's also in the Atlanta area. And if you were to, to come to this area to visit the general, you could also um, make a side trip to visit the Texas as well. So with that, let's jump into our story of the chase. Um, so these are our two, um, we'll call them both our protagonists. It's interesting, depending on who tells the story or, or who, was, who was writing the history back then, who was viewed as a, a hero and he was viewed as a villain, but um, we're not going to get into any of that here. But Andrews, James Andrews here on the left was a Union spy. He was a civilian from Kentucky. Um, but he was working with a, a Union regiment in Tennessee as a spy. Um, he and, and his regiment wanted to steal a train for the purpose of being able to interrupt supply lines. So there was a, one main rail line that was coming down from that Eastern Tennessee area down uh, to the Atlanta area. And they knew if they could disrupt that, that track and disrupt that supply line, they could get a significant upper hand in the war. So, so that was the purpose of stealing the train. Um, they had targeted the general because they didn't think there was a telegraph office here in Big Shanty, which uh, I should say Big Shanty was the name of Kennesaw before, uh, before it was named Kennesaw. So you'll hear Big Shanty and, and Kennesaw used sort of um, interchangeably. 
Um, so they, they targeted the general and the, the conductor of the general was William Fuller. So that's another name that we'll hear over and over. So when Andrews and his men came down, um, he had about 22 men from three different Ohio regiments who came down with him. They traveled in small groups um, so that they would be undetected. They wore civilian clothes, um, but they met up at what was at that point called the Fletcher House in Marietta, Georgia. And it's pictured here on the left. It's now um, called the, the, the Kennesaw House. Uh, this is a, a brochure of the Kennesaw House from the late 1950s. At the time that the Raiders stayed here, which would have been April 11th, 19, or 1862 rather, um, it actually had a fourth floor. When Sherman came through a couple years later, um, he had some connections to the, the Fletcher family and intended to spare this building, but some of the other buildings near it were burned and the fourth floor caught on fire, had some, had some damage and was never rebuilt. So that's why you only see three stories here in this picture, but there, there would have been four at the time. Um, they stayed in a room on the second floor. This building now houses the Marietta Museum of History, and they still have that room where the Raiders stayed set up like an 1860s hotel room. Um, so again, this, this brochure isn't terribly old, I think, from the late 1950s. Um, but then we do have a, a letter here that was on Kennesaw House stationery back when it was still a hotel, postmarked from 1902. So they spent that night of April 11th at the Fletcher House, and then the next morning, April 12th, they made their way to the Lacey Hotel. Um, it's interesting, anything that we read about the great locomotive calls this building the Lacey Hotel, but when we look at contemporary newspapers from that time, we don't, we don't see that name. The proprietor was George Lacey. Um, but it may have been called the Bishani Eating House. It may have had some other name and just sort of colloquially called Lacey's Hotel. Um, so that just sort of an interesting thing that, that that name has stuck, even though we're not sure it was in use. Um, dining cars weren't really used at that time. So it was very normal for, for trains to stop at a hotel like this or an establishment like this so that their passengers could eat. Um, so the train had stopped 20 minutes for breakfast and the Raiders took that opportunity to unhook the general from its cars and start making their way north. So I, I know this is hard to see, and we, we definitely won't get into the detail, but let me just turn on my laser pointer here and see if this works. I just wanted to just orient you, if you're not familiar with this area, to some of the cities along the way. So at the very bottom here in the, the lower right, that's, that's Atlanta. And then a little bit north of Atlanta, we have Marietta, where the Fletcher House was located. And then on up the line, Big Shanty here, and that's now Kennesaw. That's where I am right now. Um, and that's where the, the um, Lacey Hotel was, where the, where the train was stolen. Um, going on further up the line, we get to the, the town of Kingston, um, Adairsville, Calhoun. We'll hear some of these names again as we're going through more of the, the story of the chase. All the way on up to Dalton, Tunnel Hill. And then right here, just south of the Tennessee line, um, you see Ringgold. And that's where the chase ended, just a little bit uh, south of Chattanooga. Um, so there's Chattanooga right there in the, the upper left. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, though, about um, this particular map, and just because we'll hear this name again, this was drawn by Wilbur Kurtz, and Wilbur Kurtz was involved with a number of Hollywood films. He was known for a lot of the paintings that he did for Gone with the Wind. Um, he did have some association with Disney, even for the Great Locomotive Chase. Um, when Disney made Song of the South, they sent Mary Blair to Georgia um, to tour the area, and he, he was the one who took her around on the tour. Um, and then he was hired to serve as the technical advisor for the Great Locomotive Chase movie. Um, but conveniently, he was married to one of William Fuller's daughters. So he definitely had a connection um, to this area and, and, and to the, the chase itself. Um, so the, just to orient you as well, the length of the chase, so going from Big Shanty here up to this Ringgold area is 87 miles, um, which I know doesn't sound like a lot in today's terminology. You know, we were just talking about 45 miles to Anaheim and you might be able to make that in 45 minutes. But remember trains, steam locomotives at that time didn't move nearly as quickly and had to stop for uh, refueling and, and to, to take on more water. So, um, so this was an all day chase. Uh, Fuller's men, once, once the um, general started to leave Big Shanty, Fuller and his men chased it on foot. Then they picked up a hand car at Moom Station, which is just a little bit past Big Shanty, not very far up the road here. Um, Andrews and his men on the general passed the town of Etowah, 
And there was a, another train parked there called the Yona, um, but they decided to leave it. They didn't take the time to stop it or to destroy the tracks around it. So that gave Fuller an opening to use the Yona to chase Andrew's Raiders. Now the Yona did not survive, so I don't have any other pictures or anything of the Yona. So um, for, for the rest of the story, we'll use a couple of these Wilbur Kurtz paintings. Or I think about 10 of these paintings. I've got just a few of them in the, um, in the presentation here. But um, so you can see here, this is uh, the, the, the Texas is uh, starting to make its way into the story. So the, when the Raiders got to Kingston, they were delayed about an hour. There was a southbound train coming, so they had to wait for that train to pass. Um, so that delayed them for about an hour. And then Fuller was able to catch up with them around Kingston, getting a little bit closer, closing that gap. Um, they picked up an, another train there called the William R. Smith, which also didn't survive. Um, the Raiders pulled up some of the tracks south of Adairsville. Fuller had to pursue on foot. Um, eventually, they, they got to the town of Calhoun, um, where they were able to pick up another train called the Texas. Um, the Texas, though, had been headed south. So in order to, to engage the Texas and use it in the chase, Fuller actually ran it in reverse. Um, so a lot of times when you see paintings related to the chase or um, you know, any, any footage related to the chase, you see that the one train uh, heading, heading north, the other train in the, heading in the wrong direction or turned the wrong direction, but also heading north behind it. So um, it's kind of a, a popular image that we see of the general in the Texas. So like I said, the chase ended just past Ringgold. Um, there was some rain that day, so their wood was wet. They eventually ran out of fuel um, and, and finally gave it up around the Ringgold area. The Raiders scattered. Um, they were all captured, though, within about two weeks, and um, not surprisingly, they were charged as unlawful combatants and spies in the Confederate military courts. Um, James Andrews and seven others of the Raiders were hanged. Um, eight escaped custody and were able to make their way back to Union lines. Um, the remaining six, they were held as prisoners of war, eventually made their way back north as part of a prisoner exchange. So we're gonna look for just a minute here at where they're buried. Most of the raiders, are, um, at least the ones who were hanged are buried in Chattanooga, which again, is just a little bit north of where the, the chase ended just over the Tennessee line. Um, there's a very nice monument here that was erected in 1890. Um, it mentions that the this is called Ohio's Tribute to the Andrews Raiders. I know it's hard to see the text on the side of it there. Um, on the back side of it, it lists the, the raiders who were buried in this, in this cemetery. And then there are um, the individual tombstones here that you can see. And I'll just point out too, I think I mentioned that James Andrews was a civilian. You can see that on his tombstone there. Um, a lot of what I read mentioned that William Campbell, um, who's the second from the right on the bottom, was a civilian as well. But it's interesting he's not listed that way on, on his um, tombstone here. So I'm not, not sure what that discrepancy is. The back side of that monument, or the, the side that you see here, does list the, um, the other raiders who escaped. Um, and this is just a, a broader view of that cemetery there. Um, among the things that we've collected, we have a number of postcards. This seems to be a very popular site for postcards for some reason. Um, these are a couple of the older cards. We can tell they're from before 1907 because the back isn't split. Um, so before 1907, um, only the, the address could be printed on the, on the back side. You couldn't have a message on, on the back as well. So that's why you see a lot of these older postcards with messages written on the front of the card like this. So these two are from 1905 on the left to 1904. And this one was interesting. I, I don't have a particular date for this one because it wasn't um, postmarked and, and there's not a date printed on it. But I thought it was, it was cute that the person who um, got this card, used it uh, almost like a little diary, and uh, it's hard to read here, but she basically tells the story of the general, just in, in her own words, the story of the chase. I like to collect old postcards, but I, I also like when they, um, I like the ones that are pristine that haven't been sent, but the ones that have been used always have a, a story around them. I love to read what people write on, on postcards. Um, so this is Oakland Cemetery, which is down in um, downtown Atlanta. Fuller and um, the, the men who participated in the chase with him are buried in Oakland Cemetery. This is also very close to the site of the hanging. So the, the ones who were hanged, um, there's a, a monument here uh, near Oakland Cemetery to, um, to commemorate them and, and their, their efforts. 
So here's Fuller's monument. You can see he lived until 1906. And then the two men who were with him during the chase, Jeff Kane was the engineer on the general. Um, Anthony Murphy was, we think, some sort of shop foreman, um, but he joined with, with Fuller and Kane in the chase. So for, for their efforts, the, the Raiders were given the, the Medal of Honor. The Medal of Honor had just been established, um, but no one had, um, had received it yet. So Jacob Parrott was one of the Raiders. He was actually the youngest of the Raiders, was 19. Um, he was the very first to receive the Medal of Honor, not just among the Raiders, but the, the first ever to receive the Medal of Honor. Um, two of the medals um, up from the Raiders are housed at the museum. Only one is on display right now. I think the other one is out for conservation, um, but you can see at least one of the medals um, if you come to the, the Southern Museum. And we'll talk a little bit more about the, the Southern Museum in a little bit. Right outside the Southern Museum, and again, this is the, the museum where the general is located today. Um, there is a marker to commemorate the general. There's a marker for Fuller. Um, the marker that you see on the bottom left there looks just like the one at the top, but it's in Ringgold, so it's at the other end of the chase. And then also right outside the museum are a few historical markers. I know there, there are other markers as you go further up along the route of the chase. Um, but, but these are the three that are just right there outside the museum. And I, I mentioned those Wilbur Kurtz paintings. Um, there's a very nice little amphitheater right across from the museum. It's hard to see in this picture, but in that picture on the upper left, um, if you can look across from where those people are sitting, back there in the stone, you can see the train etched in the stone. Let me get my laser pointer again. So right there, you can see the train in the stone. And then this sign says Big Shanty, 20 minutes for breakfast, which would have been the announcement that Fuller would have made when the train arrived at, at Big Shanty that morning. Um, and so you can see here, this is just kind of a broader view of that amphitheater. You can see the, um, the paintings along the way. And this is a, a tunnel that goes under the train track. Um, there are a couple of paintings on the other side. So again, I think, I think 10 in total. And it's, it's very popular now to take a, a driving trip. A lot of the um, sites along the, the route of the chase still have some sort of you know historical interest. There's a, a, a large furnace that is you can still see that's from that era. So um, this is just a, a brochure that lists all the different sites and, and offers that sort of driving tour. So that's the basic story of the chase. So for detail, um, you know, many books have been written on the chase. I'll show you some of those in the later slides. Um, but just wanted to give enough of the story just to kind of put some more of this in context. So let's jump into the Great Locomotive Chase and other movies. Um, so this is the VHS and DVD. And, you know, given Walt Disney's well-documented love of trains, not surprising that he would have been drawn to this story. Um, this was certainly an era when he was making a lot of action and adventure movies. Um, so it, this, this seems like a very natural fit with the rest of the, the catalog at that time. Um, the general and Texas weren't used in filming. They, you know, of course, were still around at that time. We're still around today, but it would have taken too much money to get the general or the Texas really in operating condition. Um, so they were not used. So there were other trains brought in that were from that period. The, the William Mason uh, was used in the place of the general. There was a train called the Lafayette that was used for the Yona um, and a train called the Inyo that was used for both the Texas and the William R. Smith. So that's not actually the general that you see here in the, in the movie. But again, you know, we've got our, our two protagonists here, um, James Andrews and William Fuller, portrayed in the movie by Fess Parker and Jeffrey Hunter. Fess Parker was already a big star for Walt Disney at that time uh, with the success of Davy Crockett. Um, Jeffrey Hunter isn't as well known today. He, he died relatively young at 42, um, so you know, certainly not as, as well known to Disney fans as Fess Parker. But let's jump in and see if our clip will work. I need to change just a couple of my settings here. Just a second here. This will make the video play a little bit more smoothly. We were, my son and I were playing with some of the settings this morning, so. All right. We'll give this a try and do let me know if it doesn't 
doesn't work well. We've got a couple other clips from other movies. So this will be our, our first test. This one does have sound. The other, the other two are silent movies. So this is the only one of the three with sound. So here we go. Here's a little clip from The Great Locomotive Chase from 1956. Clouding over. Yeah. Is it going to rain? Might could. Rain's one minute, shine's next. Thank you, Daisy. What's been happening in Big Shanty? Rice smart enough. <laughs> Did you see him? Deserters from the camp, most likely. They won't go far. Put it in reverse, Pete. What you men doing here? Where's your train, Mr. Fuller? The Yankees got her. Back into a dance, Bill. We'll drop these cars off at a side. Bring her back, Pete. We'll explain later. Watch my signals now. Try to coax her around the bend. It'll look better if they don't see her. All right. Did that work okay? Were you able to, to see that video? Yeah, it was a little pixelated, but it flowed through without the choppiness of the other day. Okay, good, good. So let me change my settings back here. All right, are you seeing the full screen view again? Yeah, it's just uh, the black box for the movie was. Okay. Great. So the um, the train footage there was filmed at the Tallulah Falls Railway here in Georgia. It was about 100 miles from where the actual uh, the actual path of of the chase, but um, it was a, a smaller railroad, not really in use at the time. So it was it was more available, I guess, for filming. Um, the the path of the chase is is still an active rail line today, so it wouldn't have been practical to you know, shut it down for filming. Um, that railway also has about 42, I think, of those big picturesque wooden trestles. So, you know, so, some nice long shots there. Now, the trains that were used in the movie, I mentioned, not that we're not the general in the Texas, but those trains that were used um, have survived, have been preserved. Um, a couple of them are at a, a BNO museum in Baltimore, and um, the, another one is in a, a museum in Nevada. So, it's nice to hear that those have been preserved. So here's another one of our production stills. Here's Jeffrey Hunter here. This was in the clip that we just saw. Now, most of the things that I'm showing you today are, are pictures that we have in our collection, our, just our personal family collection, um, postcards, other items from our collection. Uh, but I am going to show you a few things from the Southern Museum as well that they have. So um, in the room where the general is housed, there are, there are display cases along both sides. One of those display cases has several items related to the movie. Um, so here on the left, you can see what the display generally looks like. All of my pictures, unfortunately, have those um, reflections in them. So the museum very kindly offered um, a, another picture, a better picture of, of the coat that would have been worn by Fess Parker in that movie. It's in very good condition. I, I think there probably would have been more than more than one version of this coat, but um, the one that the museum museum has is in very good condition. Um, they have some other posters and things here on, in the display. And then on the bottom left there, they have a copy of the script. That's in their collection. They also have a couple of programs. So the movie actually premiered um, here in Atlanta at the Lowe's Grand Theater. That's the same theater where Gone with the Wind premiered in 39. Um, so this would have been June of 56 when it premiered. And, and then about a week later, they had, had a second premiere at the Strand Theater in Marietta, um, just you know, closer to where the, the events actually occurred. So, oh, and I, I should have said in the beginning, I, I, it looks like there may be some comments in the chat. I can't see the chat as I'm going through and presenting, but we'll certainly look at the chat at the end. Um, my husband and son are much more knowledgeable than I am about 
um, local history. So I'm sure if there are questions, they'll they'll jump in to help me address those. But um, I'm not able to see the chat while I'm presenting, but we definitely will get back to it. So you know, please feel free to, to put questions or comments out there and we'll pick those up. So this is an item that's actually um, in our personal collection, not, not the museums. This is called an exhibitor's campaign book. Um, and this is a good sized item. It's roughly 12 by 18 inches. And this is the kind of material that would have been sent to movie theaters to advertise the movie. So um, if you open it up, it's got information about the movie, but then it also has um, ads that that the movie theater could have placed in local newspapers. I remember when I was growing up, you know, we would always on Fridays look at the newspaper and see all the little ads for the different movies. Um, so it's interesting to see all the all the ones that would have been offered for this particular movie. Um, and I've actually got that piece sitting right here. So um, at the end of the talk, I'll I'll show it to you. It's it's an interesting one. Um, here's a German promotional brochure. Same, same kind of thing. Um, would have been sent to German exhibitors. Then just some other small items from our collection, a children's book, um, a little record that includes a couple of songs from the movie, a, a little film strip that I think probably would have been used in classrooms to tell the story of the chase. We've got a mass market paperback book here with people who look nothing like Fess Parker or Jeffrey Hunter, but that's all right. Um, here's the video disc. I don't remember what year this was produced at mid, mid 80s, I think, but um, it's another random item that we have. Um, so the Great Locomotive Chase, though, wasn't the only movie made about the general. Um, I know in some of the, the comments uh, in, in previous discussions and uh, in, in Bill's posts on Facebook, there were some comments about Buster Keaton's movie, The General, which was made in 1926. Um, it was also, it, it also didn't use the actual general. Uh, Buster Keaton did request permission to use the general and initially it was granted by the railroad, but once they realized it was a comedy and I think they, they kind of pulled back and, and some of the descendants of the chase participants weren't, weren't really on board. So he didn't use the general. He actually filmed this movie on an Oregon logging railroad. Um, and it doesn't have quite the same tone as the great locomotive chase. There's, it, it doesn't make nearly as much of an attempt to follow the actual story. So, you know, it, it doesn't have Andrews and Fuller in it. Um, it has more of a comedy romance story to it along with along with the action side of it as well. It was not very well received at the time. Um, it was very expensive to make. Um, it's now seen as culturally significant, but uh, definitely I think held in much higher regard today than it was at the, at the time that it was produced. But let's take a look at the clip from that one. Let me just change my settings here again so I can show a second clip. I think this one's gonna be really grainy. So again, this is a silent movie. There's our hero, Buster Keaton. And we'll see in a minute why this movie was so very expensive. So that's his, his love interest there, played by Marion Mack. Starting to catch up. Although note that both trains are going in the same direction. So we, we know the Texas actually ran backwards. Mm 
there we go. A big collapse. So I think that significantly had to add to the cost. All right, let me fix my settings again. Okay, are we back to seeing a, a full screen now and a photo signed by Mary and Mac? Yeah, it's looking good. Okay, good. Um, so as I mentioned, Mary and Mac was- People, people oh. may be crying from seeing that train fall into the, uh, the river, but- I know. Well, and interestingly enough, they, they apparently just left that wreckage there and it became just sort of a tourist attraction on its own for a while. And then they salvaged it and sold it for scrap during World War II. So yeah, yeah that made, made for a very expensive movie at the time. Um, mentioned the protagonist was, was played by Marion Mack. And this was a, a photograph. This is, this is not ours. This is in the Southern Museum's collection. Um, but she had signed this photograph in 1983. Um, she apparently had a, a long career in real estate after her acting career ended. Um, she passed away in 1989 at the age of 87. Um, but apparently, you know, sort of enjoyed the, the resurgence of this movie in, in her later years and um, you know, would sign photographs and that sort of thing. So I mentioned that there were several movies produced about the general. We're going to take a look. Um, well, we may not show the clip of this next one because it's, it's very grainy. Um, but these are a, a couple of video collections, um, one called Here Comes the General, um, one listed as rare videos of the general. A lot of content is the same between these two, just different formats. But you see at the bottom um, of that list of rare videos of the general, there's one called Railroad Raiders of 1962. Uh, this was a silent film that was made actually in 1911. Um, and it's the, the length of it is listed as 1,000 feet, but it, it's about nine minutes long. Um, and it, it is you know, available on the Library of Congress website. So we won't pause and show that clip in the interest of time, um, but just yet another movie based on, on the facts of the, the story of the chase. It was filmed in Jacksonville, Florida. So a couple of other videos here. Um, I mentioned the Southern Museum of Locomotive History. They have a, a little um, theater where they show a, a film strip before people get into the gallery where they see the general. And they've made their own version of, of movies just to show in the museum. So this is a, a couple of those. And just another interesting item that we had. This is a, a little record just called Sounds of the General. I think someone just recorded um, the sounds of the, of the steam locomotive. So. Um, or, or was talking at the beginning of the call about all the videos that are out there on YouTube. I guess this, this is the 1950s version of that. <laughs> just, to, just to hear the sounds of steam locomotives. This apparently was one in a series. So let's talk a little bit about the general from the time the war ended until it came to uh, its, its current home here in Kennesaw. So at the end of the war, um, it was definitely in disrepair. This is a photo from 1864, right after the siege of Atlanta. Um, the train actually at that point was about nine years old. It had been built in 1955 um, by a company in Patterson, New Jersey. Uh, prior to the war, it had uh, provided freight service between Atlanta and Chattanooga. And um, so at this point though, in 64, uh, this is a couple years after the chase, the, the war was near the end. Um, it's missing the cab and the dome, uh, the stack is ruptured, the tender is damaged. Um, we know that the U.S. Military Railroad had title until about September of 1865, um, so there probably was some sort of repair done um, at that point. And then in December of 1870, um, there was a, a deal made between Georgia and Western and Atlantic. Western and Atlantic had been a, a public company, um, a public utility. Some of their operations were privatized at that point. Um, and as part of that whole deal, there were 45 engines that were transferred to the Western and Atlantic. Um, the general was one of those. It was given number 39 at that time. It was taken to Western and Atlantic's um, shops in Atlanta and rebuilt at that time. Sometime in the 1870s, it was converted from, from uh, wood burning to coal fuel and was given a diamond stack at that time. Um, the gauge was actually reduced from five feet to 
Um, I've seen four nine or four eight and a half uh, to, to align with national standards. It may have been renumbered to number three around that time, which is the number it, it has today. Um, it was the third oldest train on the railroad. That's why it was given number three when it was renumbered. Um, and then in 1890, that Western and Atlantic lease was acquired by the Nashville, Chattanooga, and St. Louis, the NC and St. L Railroad. Um, it was included in the, the paperwork as part of that deal. It was noted as condemned with a value of $250. So, so not in great shape at that point. And these are just a couple of items related to the Western and Atlantic Railroad. There's a, a ticket there at the top, um, a reprint of a, a brochure that was used, um, and then some uh, railroad script, which interestingly enough is from April of 1862, which is the same month as the chase. So these items aren't related specifically to the chase, but just to the, the railroad during that period. In 1891, the general was found in an area here in Atlanta called Binings. Um, it was on a siding with other retired 440s. It was found by a Chattanooga photographer and exhibitor. Um, he took some interest in it. It was restored at that point to its 1871 appearance, I think. I think that's when it was switched back to Woodburn. Um, and it was put on exhibit at Union Station in Chattanooga at that time. So we've got several postcards um, from, from that time in Chattanooga. That sign that you see on the lower left of that top postcard is actually in the Southern Museum today. It's not, it's not on display, it's just back in their storage area. Uh, but I like that that postcard includes a reunion of the surviving raiders. And um, you can see what, it, what the general looked like when it was in position there in Union Station. These next couple of slides just show some of the, the many postcards that seem to have been produced during that time period. Um, I love the colors on these. It, it, you can tell that for a lot of these, they really used the same photograph and just colored it in different ways. Um, but during those Union Station years, the general was loaded on a flatbed and transported to fairs and other, you know, other places for display a number of times. Um, some of the documents that I saw indicated that it was taken to the 1893 fair in Chicago. Um, I've looked through all the books I have about that 1893 fair and haven't found any reference to it. So I'm not sure if that happened or, or not. Maybe it just wasn't mentioned, but I, I haven't been able to find anything to, um, to, to show you related to that. It was at the Atlanta Cotton States Exhibition in 1895. Um, and then I also read that it was at the Centennial Exhibit um, in Nashville. It, there was an exhibit in 1897 that celebrated the 100th anniversary of the, the state of Tennessee in Nashville. That's when the Parthenon building in Nashville was built, if you're familiar with, with the Nashville area. But I haven't found any, any photographs of the general there either. But we do have pictures from some other fairs. So this is one that Bill provided um, from Chicago from 1933. And I, I love the nuns there in the picture. One thing that's interesting about 33, if you take a close look at the stack, um, it looks like it was put on backwards. So those little points right there, and I'm, I'm sure there's a technical term for those that I just don't know. Um, at the 33 fair, they're on the front, but in all the other pictures that we have, they're on the, the back side of the stack. So don't know what, what happened there, but um, it did come to the New York World's Fair in 1939. This is another picture that Bill provided. And you, you notice you don't see those little points there because they're on the, the back of the stack there. This is a picture that we had in our collection, very similar to the one that Bill provided. I just, I thought it was interesting. Someone had taken this picture and taped it to a card and on the back of it, they wrote October 25th, 1940. Again, I like those, those personal touches, anything with, you know, with handwriting. Um, I like to see how people have, have saved their memories. It also made an appearance at the 1948 Railroad Fair in Chicago. This picture uh, was stamped August 21st, 1948 on the back. I like when there's a specific date like that. Another picture from the 1948 Railroad Fair in Chicago. And then this picture, this, this is one that's in our collection, but it's a little bit of a mystery. Um, it's obviously the general on display but we don't know what, what this display is. This building that it's sitting next to doesn't look like any of the buildings in those other pictures that I just showed you. Um, so we'll, we'll have to keep trying to track this one down. I'm not sure what this particular display is, but it's a nice photograph, so I left it in. So that takes us up to about the 1950s. Um, so the, the general was still in Chattanooga at that point, other than these little side excursions that it took to Ferris. 
Um, the NC and St. L Railroad was absorbed by the Louisville and Nashville, the L&N Railroad in 1957. And at that point, the L&N um, magazines, they had a, an internal magazine, their magazine staff and the PR department became interested in reenacting the chase as part of the Civil War centennial. So, you know, coming up in 1962, they thought it would be a great time to, to get the general back in working order um, and um, participate in that chase. So they had to get the general out of Chattanooga to do that. And the l &N president at the time decided to handle it, and this is a quote I saw, by removing the locomotive one night and explaining why afterward. So on the night of June 9th, 1961, after the last passenger had left the depot, l &N police were stationed outside this, the Union Station area. Uh, a welder cut through the wire fence. They built 60 feet of temporary track, covered the general with a tarp, and then got the general out of Union Station the next morning. They took it up to Louisville to the l &N shops to begin the restoration. So um, the magazine article I read about that called it, called it the second capture of the general. I thought that was interesting that, you know, under cover of night, they took it out of Union Station. So we've got several pictures here from that restoration. Um, the years, I've, I've seen a couple of different dates, um, as early as 59, as late as 61, when that restoration actually started. Um, they had to find someone who was capable of working on steam engines at that time. You know, that was sort of a, a lost art at that point. Um, but the person that they, that they found was named W.A. Gaines, and his fourth grade teacher was one of William Fuller's daughters. So he had an interesting uh, connection there to the chase. So you can see in these different pictures that um, they've taken the general apart, do all the restoration. So the pictures on this slide and the next one we received from uh, the son of a man named C.R. Duffy, and he was one of the people who worked on the restoration. I'll just show you one more photograph here of the restoration. I love the light coming in through the windows on this one. So th this was not um, one of the ones that we received from C.R. Duffy's son, but uh, just a, a nice photograph. But we did receive a, a boiler inspection report um, from this restoration time period, but we also received a little box that had some bolts that were removed from the general during that restoration. And a little note handwritten by Mr. Duffy that explains um, what these were. We've got a stay bolt and um, there's a, a bolt with an angular head and a bolt with a more rounded head. So he believes that these would have been on the general when it was built in 1855. Um, we thought this was an interesting item, and you know the, the general has undergone so many restorations over the years. When we when we found these, my son uh, joked that with these bolts, we probably have about as much of the original general as the museum has. It's, it's gone through so many restorations over the years. There's probably not a lot left, left that's truly original, um, but these these bolts may be. So just an interesting item there. That collection also included an eight millimeter film strip. We have no way to to play that, so I don't know exactly what's on it. Um, I think the documentation we received said that it was footage after the um, after the general right after the general was restored and it was running so if anyone wants to take a crack at that let me know we'll, we'll get it to you um, so the whole purpose of that restoration though was to get ready for this recreation of the chase um, that event did happen in April of 1962 they tried to keep that reenactment to eight hours um, to align with the, the length of the original chase um, a little bit complicated because they had celebrations in Kennesaw. That's what you see pictured here. Um, one of the other cities along the way, I don't remember which one, and then also a celebration in Ringgold. So trying to cram all that in eight hours, you had people lined up along the track the whole way um, to celebrate this, um, this recreation of the chase. After the chase, the general was taken around the country on some other tours. Um, these are some of the postcards from some of those other tours. I, I don't have specific dates or cities on these, except for that one on the lower left which we know is from the Norfolk and Western's Roanoke shops. Um, there's a ticket on the lower right from one of these excursions with the general um, in Nashville of, in July of 62. We've got a couple of photographs here from Columbus, Ohio from May of 1962. And then here's another photograph with the general on the way to the 1964 World's Fair. So this is another photograph that Bill provided. I like the color on this one. This little couple here sitting on the lower right. I'm, they, I'm, they look like somebody's grandparents. Um, 
Here's another photograph we had from, from this 1964 period. This one is marked on the back as April 28, 1964, during the Derby Festival, excuse me, during the Derby Festival Parade, hard to say, at 10th and Broadway. So I assume that Derby Festival Parade was some sort of event related to the fair. Um, I need to look that up and, and see exactly what that was. But again, nice to have an exact date. So I mentioned that the general came to Kennesaw in 72. Um, in between, there was a, a lot of legal wrangling about where the general would ultimately reside. There was a resolution in the Georgia General Assembly to put the general in a museum in Kennesaw. Um, the Big Shanty Historical Society was incorporated to, to help with that effort. The general was taken to Louisville to wait out those court battles between the state of Georgia and the city of Chattanooga. Um, there was a lot of fundraising that happened, um, a lot of you know, appeals. It actually almost made its way to the US Supreme Court. Um, the Supreme Court was declined to hear the case, which meant that the lower court's ruling that granted the general to the state of Georgia was upheld. And on April 12, 1972, so 110 years after the chase, um, the Big Shanty Museum was open to the public and they had a, a commemoration ceremony. And we'll look at some pictures of that. So uh, this is one of the fundraising brochures. This is a, a Christmas card that was sent out that was used as a, a fundraiser for the general. This is the little booklet that celebrates the return to Kennesaw in 1972. Um, you can see pictures of, get my laser pointer again, um, of some of the, the mayor and some of the citizens of Kennesaw at the time. And then on the lower right here, that's Jimmy Carter, um, who was the governor of Georgia at the time giving a speech. Um, most of this booklet is ads for local businesses, uh, but it does have a nice description of the chase, um, some photos related to the return, a fairly detailed chronology, um, it's a nice little booklet. And this is a postcard that shows the museum construction. Um, so this would be from 1971, 19, probably, probably early 1972. Um, the building still looks very similar to this. It's gone, undergone several renovations and expansions over the years, but um, still has that same look. This building was originally a cotton gin and it was purchased by Steve Fry in 1948 as we can see here from the Marietta Daily Journal. Um, the Fry family um, later donated this building um, to, the, to the city for the purpose of using it as a museum to house the general. So this is what the Big Shaney Museum would have looked like at the time that it opened and a couple of brochures and you know, commemorative tickets and that sort of thing related to it. Of course, my question was, how do they get that big train in that building? Um, so we have a picture here. Let me skip over. They backed it in. So there's some, some looks like temporary track built. There are some of these pictures that I, I pulled this from um, had a, a crane. So it looks like quite a big operation, but they, they backed it in and then you know, built the rest of the building around it. And it's still there today. Um, in August of 95, the, the building was renamed to the Kennesaw Civil War Museum. And then ultimately, um, as I mentioned, under one of the large renovation starting in 2001, reopened in March of 2003 as the Southern Museum of Civil War and Locomotive History, um, which is what it's still called today. It's undergone a, an expansion since then. They've built on a, a couple of areas in the back. Um, this is what it looks like today. I actually took that picture last Saturday, right after, um, after uh, Bill's talk ended, went over and, and took that picture of the museum. So here's the general and its current home. Um, so notice that walkway at the back there, I'll show you a couple of pictures from that walkway. So here's just the different views from the side. Um, up on that walkway, you can see into the cab. Occasionally, they have member events um, in which they allow members to, to actually climb on board the general, go into the cab. They haven't had one of those in a few years, but interestingly, there is one coming up in December. Um, so we'll try to do that if we can. I think we've got some, some other events going on that day. December's always a busy month, even, even with the pandemic going on. Um, but normally when they have these events, they'll have a, a poster like this that explains what the different parts of the cab are. Here are a couple of pictures from inside the cab. And I wanted to mention that Southern Museum of Civil War and Locomotive History um, has other locomotive um, interest as well. So in Marietta, there was a um, 
an operation called the Glover Machine Works. It was the South's last steam locomotive builder. They produce smaller locomotives, um, about 200 in total. And the museum does house their collection. You know, a lot of the um, artifacts that were that were left behind when that um, operation was shut down. The Glover family is still very prominent here in the Marietta area. Um, so like, like to see the museum besides just the general. Um, and this, this picture, apropos of nothing, I just like seeing all these lanterns. This is back in the storage area in the museum. So there we are, that's the general today. So um, I have several slides here with other memorabilia. Um, we'll go through these relatively quickly. I know we're, we're getting a little short on time. So um, there were several booklets that were produced. This is the oldest one that we have in our collection from 18, uh, sorry, 1904. But then over the years, the railroads produced a number of brochures related to the general. So we've got one here from 1910. Um, one from 1917 from the railroad. Um, it, it mentions here in the middle colored lithographs of the general for 10 cents. There's an address to write in. We, we actually have some of the old lithographs that the railroad sold, so um, I can show you one of those at the end of the presentation as well. Another railroad brochure. This must be from 34, 35. It mentions the appearance of the general at the, the fair in Chicago. Also has the ad about the, the lithograph for 10 cents. The colored lithograph um, in the late 50s for sure it mentions the lithograph but it's black and white so the, the ones we have are colored so I, I think that means they're older um, this one's interesting because it also includes that picture of the last reunion of the um, of the surviving raiders and then another brochure from the Louisville and Nashville Railroad. Um, I love the picture there on the left that shows the size of the general compared to a, a modern locomotive. We have a, a similar photograph like that same same sort of comparison they were trying to make in 1952. Um, we'll go through the rest of these quickly. This one was produced for um, really more of a, not from the railroad, but from the city of Chattanooga to promote that the, the general was on exhibit at Union Station. It almost has a little comic book sort of telling of the story of the general. A uh, couple of issues of Trains magazines over the years. The one on the left was from the Centennial in 1962, and then again from the Sussequit Centennial in April of 2012. Both of these, if you're um, interested in Trains and able to get your hands on these, these would have fairly lengthy articles, about 10 or 12 pages each with a number of pictures. Um, definitely a lot of good information included here. Um, they also had a March 1957 issue that included a salute to the general, but we don't have that one in our collection. It's a, a French magazine from 1963. So I guess the general's popularity even made its way overseas. Some other booklets. This, this one celebrates the 144 Ohioans who were awarded the Medal of Honor for service during the Civil War, including the 22 um, from the chase. Some other Railway and Locomotive Historical Society books. Um, a book showing st stereo cards from the general. I unfortunately don't have any of those. I have a very nice stereoscope and um, a number of old cards, but none with the general. This was a carving that was done by uh, Mr. Ernest Warther. Um, it's in the Warther Museum in Dover, Ohio, but it's a, a carving of walnut and ivory of the general. Some trading cards. Automatic Switch Company had a series of, of prints dedicated to different trains, and including one of the general, some comic books. But I, I do want to show you a few of these booklets. We're going to get into some, some books. If, if you're interested in the general, want to learn more about the story, um, these are some small booklets that were produced by Robert Jones, who is a local historian here in this area. Um, couple of other books about the general. There, there's one I don't have a picture of. Actually, one of the earliest accounts of the chase was written by William Pittenger, who was one of the raiders in 1863. Um, it was called Daring and Suffering. Uh, it was reprinted a number of times over the years. It was even renamed a couple of times. I think ultimately was called the Great Locomotive Chase. Um, couple more books on the general that are still in publication today. 
This one on the right here is fairly recent about stealing the general. A few more books, um, some envelopes and stamps. We've got several commemorative coins in our collection related to the general. So a larger picture of one here. This is a nice one. They, they actually have one of these in the museum under glass. This is just, you know, on my kitchen table. Um, some different keychains and pins produced over the years. Patches, very common in this area to see the general used and, you know, city logos on patches. Um, not just for Kennesaw, but for some of the other cities along the, the routes that it's Kingston, Tunnel Hill, Adairsville. Um, Adairsville actually had made a bid to get the Texas. They wanted to house the Texas and Adairsville. Um, th they have a three-day festival every year called the Great Locomotive Chase Festival. Um, they had that since the 1970s. It was, of course, canceled this year because of coronavirus. Um, but that's something that's a, a tradition that they carried on for a number of years. Some com commemorative plates here. A printing block. I would love to see what a, a print looks like um, made from this block. Just some other small items, a tie tag, a dress book, a you know, pencil sharpener. This is one of my favorites um, just because I, I think it's funny. This is a, a very fancy box here. Um, has some, you know, some gold ink on it, the 440 on top. And it contains, believe it or not, Avon Wild Country Aftershave. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting bottle shaped like a train. The bottle that we have actually is still full of aftershave and it smells just like you would think Avon aftershave would smell after many years. It's, it's not good. Um, and then another glass bottle we have, I don't think this is very old, but it um, you know, commemorates the, the company that made the general, Rogers Ketchum and Grover in New Jersey. So just a quick word here on the Texas before we move into our Q&A piece. So as I, as I mentioned, the Texas is the other train that's most closely associated with the chase. It's the other, the other train that survived. Um, this is a drawing of the Texas by Wilbur Kurtz. Um, it was also built in Patterson, New Jersey, but by a different builder than the general. Roughly the same size, roughly the same power as the general. After the chase, it was used to transport salt from an area called Saltville in Western Virginia back to Georgia. You know, salt was, was very scarce at that time. So, um, they, they um, decided to use the Texas specifically to transport salt. I thought that was interesting. Not much is known about the Texas between 1866 and 1900 is that we do know that it was in service. Um, it was taken out of service in 1903. Um, it changed numbers, just like I mentioned, the general went from 39 to three. It, it also changed numbers over the years. It was converted to coal burning in the 1870s. And then in 1903, when it was taken out of service, it was moved to Emerson, Georgia, which is just a little bit north of us here. Um, it's about 20 minutes up the road here. They had a small branch line there that served mines in the area. And then in 1907, there was a campaign that began to save the Texas and to, to preserve it. Um, so the city of Atlanta ultimately did move to preserve the Texas. They moved it to an area in downtown Atlanta, down near the zoo called Grant Park in 1911. There were several articles celebrating it. At, at the time, it was um, it was outside, as you see here in this postcard. And actually, that area that it's in um, had a, a Civil War fort um, with with earthworks, and uh, those earthworks are still visible down there today. And then in 1927, it was moved into a building in that same Grant Park area. Um, there's a, a large circular diorama um, here in Atlanta called the Cyclorama. They built a building for the Cyclorama and put the Texas in the basement of that building. Um, it was restored in 1936 back to the 1850s, 1860s era look. Wilbur Kurtz was involved in that restoration. Um, this is just a, a publication of a, a local historical group. This is Cobb Landmarks. Um, but this particular issue had a lot of information about the Texas and its path over the year was, was very helpful in putting this together. Um, so then in 2014, plans were announced to move both the Texas and the Cyclorama to the Atlanta History Center, which is in Buckhead here in Atlanta. The Texas was taken to Spencer Shops in North Carolina for restoration, so, or that's not too far from you in Charlotte. Um, my, my husband and sons actually were in that area and got to see the Texas just through the windows. They, uh, they weren't letting people in to, to look more closely, but they saw it through a window during that restoration period. And in November of 2018, um, the new Texas exhibit 
at the Atlanta History Center was opened. Um, Cyclorama exhibit opened just a little bit later in April of 2019, but that's where the Texas is today. So I, I don't have any pictures of it in its current location. Um, I've driven by, it's a, it's a beautiful exhibit. It's very well lit at night, even from the road, you can see, you know, it's, it, it's, it's very grand. Um, but these are just a few postcards here showing the general and the Texas together, um, all from when the Texas was at the, the Cyclorama building then. So that's what I've got. Um, certainly want to leave some time for questions and feedback. Let me stop sharing so we can get back to the chat. And um, I hear my, my husband and son coming my way. So uh, they are certainly more than capable of answering questions. So let me just take a quick look back. Let's see. OK, so Irv, your screen was stuck, but it looks like it got unstuck. OK. Good, good, good. Thank you, Joey. Yeah, I, I don't have anything as interesting as the seat from the Aquacade, but um, I did want to show a little bit of what we have. Oh, so um, David asks, one of the locomotives used in the movie is today in the West. I think that's the Inyo that was used in the Great Locomotive Chase movie. It, it is in a museum in Nevada. Carson City, I think. In Carson City. I don't quote me on that. Do you want to go look that up? Probably. Yeah. Andrew will go look that up and he will come back with a more definitive answer on that. Um, so what actual impact does stealing the general have to the war effort? Um, I, I'm not an expert on Civil War history, but um, I don't know. They, they were able to cause some disruption. Um, there was some damage to the tracks. There was some damage to telegraph lines. So it, it had to have some impact, but, but not a lot since, since they were basically stopped before they got too far up the line. Well, what happened on that was, uh, again, they, they got caught very quickly. They didn't do a lot of damage, but right. it put a tremendous fear into the Confederacy that it could happen again. True. So they ended up having to divert a tremendous number of troops to protect all the railroads and the borders in that area. So they, uh, the, the raid didn't do a lot of damage, but it caused a tremendous ripple effect in terms of uh, Confederate troop deployment. So overall, it was judged to be uh, extremely successful in disrupting the, the troops as, you know, as compared to disrupting the train. Oh, thank you. Oh, so I found it. Okay. Nevada State Railroad Museum in Carson City. Okay. Andrew says it's the Nevada State Railroad Museum in Carson City where the, the Inyo is located today. So, so thank you for that, Bill. Yeah, it definitely had to hurt morale. You have to know that a train could be stolen right there under their noses. Um, let's see, looking back here, no retakes possible on that shot. Don, I'm assuming you're talking about the, the general movie with the, the bridge collapse and yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, another wonderful Keaton movie is Our Hospitality about social mores in the South. I, I don't know that one, but I'll have to look for it. Um, what company manufactured the general? Bobby. Yeah, it was the Rogers, Rogers Ketchum and Grosvenor in Patterson, New Jersey. It was built in 1855. Um, who named it the general and why? Now that I'm not sure. Do you know, Andrew? I've never heard an answer. Okay, that one we don't know, but we'll uh, we'll look into that and maybe come back to you with an answer. Most of the trains on the railroad at the time were named, one was named Texas, we don't know why. A lot of them were named Native American after two places Native in Georgia. Names, right, that makes sense with the, the others in this area. Okay, I think that's all the items in the chat. Other questions <laughs> though or comments? Yeah, if folks have questions, just uh, put up your hand either with the electric, you know, the push the button or uh, you know, wave your hand. One thing I, I wanted to mention, uh, I had the pleasure of going to Chicago with Fess Parker for a weekend to uh, open a museum exhibit there. And uh, Disney sent me, the Disney archivist, and Fess. And we were sitting in the, uh, the bar drinking. We came up, uh, the subject of the, the general, you know, the, the great locomotive chase came up. And Fest was uh, very enthusiastic talking about the experience because he said, what boy didn't want to drive a train? And uh, you know, his character in the movie doesn't get to do it, but they would back the train up and they would you know, do take after take. And he said, Walt was just like a kid in a toy shop. And uh, he would always call him Mr. Disney. He goes, well, Mr. Disney and I, we would take the train out and we would back it up. And he, he, he just was saying what a thrill it was to, uh, to be out driving a a real steam train, every every boy's, you know, every boy's dream. 
So questions, observations. So Beth, I want to thank you for putting it together. Again, super fascinating. It's a tremendous piece of real American history. Thank you. Well, I, I did just want to show a couple of other items. I mentioned those lithographs from the railroad. So this is this is one. You can see it as a nice color item. I'm trying to get it a little bit closer to the camera. Yeah. So clearly from when the railroad was at Union Station, you can see those arches that were in all the, the Union Station postcards. Can I give you 10 cents yeah. for it? <laughs> I've got extras, so. <laughs> um, and then this is that exhibitor's campaign book that I wanted to show. You see, it's, it's fairly large, opens up fairly large, has a lot of, it looks like almost a, a newspaper format on the first few pages with information about the film. Um, but then on the later pages, you can see all the, the different ads that were available for um, for movie theaters to provide. Now, on the, the Disney History Institute Facebook page, someone posted in the last day or two that he collects these, these campaign booklets. He didn't mention this one specifically, but he had posted some pictures from um, some of the booklets from, I think, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Um, so I've never heard of collecting these before. This is the only one that we have, but something to be on the lookout for. And then I was just also going to show, too, these are those bolts that I've showed the pictures of that were taken off the general. So they're not large, but um, definitely sturdy. This one's got some, definitely some wear to it. So those were, we think original to the general. We don't know. That's pretty cool. Baron, you have your hand up. Uh, if you would uh, unmute yourself. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. <laughs> Oh, well, very good presentation, Beth. That was uh, very enlightening. I did not know anything about uh, the, the general uh, or the great locomotive chase. Uh, so I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to go download the movie with Fess Parker. I'm going to go download the movie with Buster Keaton. And in one of the, in one of the, I think in the, in the booklet, one of the ads, it also showed that it was double billed with a, another Disney movie called Men Against Arctic, I believe That's I right. saw that, and I don't know that one, so I'm going to go find that one. I'm also going to go find Sounds of the Steam Locomotive <laughs> General soundtrack that you showed. I don't right. know if that was on YouTube or not, but uh, uh, I'm going to go see if I can find that. And um, and then on top of that, I just thought I, for some of us who are photographers out there, uh, as a as a as a help to get rid of the glare next time when you take photos behind mirror windows and things like that is if you're using a better camera like a DSLR and SLR not a point right. and shoot, but attach a circular polarizing filter to the front of it and and you can turn it around and it'll help eliminate the the glare from the mirror and stuff like that I know you had mentioned that um, in the one photograph where you said right. you had glare in front of the thing so I didn't know if you were aware of that or not just a circular polarizing filter well, normally yeah, take care of your... yeah i think that one was just with my phone but uh, yeah here's a another i'll hold this up men against the arctic I, i'm not familiar arctic. with that one either but yeah i'm not familiar with that i'm gonna go look that up too as i'm as i as i like fess parker and i generally watch uh uh daniel boone you know here on the weekends i guess when right. it shows on on me tv or whatever the uh, uh, antenna tv or something like that whichever one that generally shows it on the weekend. But um, uh, I want to thank you again. That was very informative, something that I was not aware of. And, uh, you know, it's it has sparked my interest. So thanks again, Beth. Well, great. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I should have mentioned that both the, the General from 1926 and that Railroad Raiders from 1962 are both just available um, publicly. They're, you know, out of copyright. I think both on the Library of Congress website. So, so both okay. of those are, are definitely easy to find. I don't think the Great Locomotive Chase is on Disney Plus. I, I thought it might be, but it doesn't seem to be out there yet. So okay. We can start a campaign. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I find it, I'll let you know. I have, I can, it may be out there somewhere floating around the cyber cloud. Right. So we'll see if right. I can. And, and the DVD is easy to find too. Yeah, the D, or the DVD, right, exactly. I'm tempted to go watch it this afternoon now. Ah. <laughs> it was interesting, as, as your press book showed, it was done in CinemaScope. And right. then uh, years later, Disney had to redo it uh, for um, television viewing. So um, when they showed it on the Disney Channel, they uh, you know thought they were going to be showing the widescreen version. And they originally ended up showing the, uh, the other one, which has totally different titles 
and uh, the, uh, it actually they had re-edited. So uh, there's two Disney has two versions of the movie out, and they were about eight minutes. One's about eight minutes shorter than the other one, but uh, it's it's just kind of interesting how you know they lose track. Oh, Men Against the Arctic was part of the People and Places series, so they did. Uh, somebody would go to Samoa, somebody else would go, um, you know, whatever, you know, Walt and Cruz around the. Uh, uh, um, the world to go catch, capture those. And I don't know if that's online, but I, I think that's on, on one of the uh, Disney treasure tins of, uh, of DVDs. You know, DVD. yeah, it's, it's pretty much a 1950s travel log sort of thing about people in snow. Men Against the Arctic, by the way, is streaming on Amazon Prime for four bucks. Is it? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, Great Locomotive Chits. I'm sorry. It's oh, great, oh, great Locomotive Chits. Yeah. Okay. I'm looking for a man against the Arctic now. The other, the other thing real quick is that you, you were mentioning that there are people uh, that do collect ex uh, uh, exhibit of books for motion pictures and things like that. I, I have one or two in my collection of old stuff, but one that I cherish the most is not necessarily a booklet, you know, the large size but it was an actual book itself that um, Cinerama had given to movie exhibitors uh, for How the West Was Won uh, um, when it was first premiered in, in three strip Cinerama. Uh, and that's a cherished item that I've had for a long time. But yes, uh, people do collect that stuff. Yeah, I had a lot of those uh, exhibitor books and I got rid of them about two, three years ago because they were so big, it's just so hard to, uh, uh, you know, to store them any place. But uh, I kept scans of most of them before I got rid of them. And all sorts of little minutia, only like you mentioned, the first two pages are done like newspaper stories and it was so they could plant it in the local paper. And a lot of those things are hard to find in good condition because the theaters would actually cut the ads out, send it to the newspaper to, you know, paste up. So you'll get one of the press books. It looks really good until you get to like page nine and there'll be a giant hole in the middle of it. Been destroyed, right? Yeah. So it's good to have it in good shape like yours. So how often do you get to go over and see the general? You know, I, I don't go that often. When, when my boys were little, they're 12 and 14 now, um, they would go to mommy and me classes every week. I, I work full time. My husband's a stay at home dad. So he would take the kids to, they called it mommy and me, but he was the dad. Um, but they would go every, every week. Um, we don't get over there as much now. They still volunteer occasionally for events. Um, but it's literally just a couple of miles from here. So we, you know, after, after uh, this meeting ended last Saturday, um, we just ran over and took a few more pictures. It's very close. We're members. Uh, so it's easy just to, to step in whenever whenever the, the mood strikes. And as I mentioned, they are having a special event. Is it December? Looking at my people here. Fit. Yeah. Um, that first Saturday in December, um, it's a, a member event. So members can, can climb up in the cab. And that's always kind of exciting. That'd be cool. Brock, you had your hand up? Yeah. Um, can you hear me OK? Yeah. Okay, uh, real great great presentation, Beth. It was really a lot of fun to watch that stuff. The interesting thing I noted was in the restoration of the Texas, the cattle guard in the front of it was kept the same with that kind of horizontal stripping versus mm -hmm. the, when you saw the old picture uh, near the end of the Civil War, War of the General when it was really beat up and half of it was gone, you could see it had the same kind of cattle guard, and yet all the restorations since then has kept the more vertical one. And I wonder why they didn't, you know, go historical on that aspect or not. Right, right. I, I don't know. That's an interesting question. And it was just interesting to note that they, you know, everywhere else they seem to really pay attention to getting it the way it was. And then that was the only place that was a little different because of that old photograph you had of what it looked like. It showed the completely different thing. So anyway. Right. When Beth was showing me the uh, bolts the other night, I was telling her a joke that Dave Smith, the Disney archivist, used to like to tell people, because they'd come in, they see like a diving suit from 20,000 Leagues. And is that original or whatever? And then this joke, uh, supposedly the guy goes back to the George Washington Museum and they have the uh, 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 hatchet there that he chopped down the cherry tree, you know, and they had the other things here, you know, the thing he threw across the river and everything, but there's the hatchet. 
and the visitor says to the uh, uh, guy, goes, you know, the uh, archivist goes, my goodness, that hatchet's in really great shape for something so old. And the guy said, yeah, we had to replace the handle twice and the head once, but it looks pretty good. <laughs> in, in World War II airplanes, uh, there's a, a builder's data plate. And as long as you have the data plate, whatever plane you put it on becomes that plane. So literally, some people will rebuild a airplane all out of spare parts that had never met together in their entire life, put it together, buy somebody's data plate, and now it becomes that plane. So restoration is um, subjective, I guess. Yeah, and they made obviously a bunch of changes to it. You know, they had to take it from wood burning to coal burning to oil burning. Uh, as Beth's picture mentioned, uh, they had air, air, air brakes to it so they could actually stop it reliably, stuff like that. But uh, she had the picture for 1964 World's Fair. It actually came to New York under steam power. So, uh, you know, d doesn't, it wasn't on a truck or, you know, uh, towed there by somebody else or anything. So uh, do you know the last time it actually was steamed up, Beth? I, I don't know. I mean, it came into that museum in 72, and I, I don't think it's been out of the museum since then. So I'm guessing 70, 72. 72. Oh, and in 72, it was on a flatbed. So it may have even been that 60, you know, four, 65, that series of runs then. Great. Well, again, really appreciate you putting it together. And as I've suggested to other people, there's a particular topic that you have a uh, enthusiasm for that you think folks might enjoy it. Obviously, we see people here liking trains. We can see a couple of them in people's backgrounds and people have mentioned it. Uh, uh, please let me know. We'd love to do it. David, uh, hang on. I think I got to hit the, yeah, you're on mute. Go ahead. I had a chance uh, when the Spruce Goose was in Long Beach, since it was uh, it was owned by the Rather Company. The Rather Company owned a Disneyland hotel, and uh, through my my work at Disney, I knew the attorney for the Rather Company, and I called him up and said, "I think it was actually a Disney attorney, Neil McClure." Um, hey, any chance to go see that before it opens to the public? And so he said, oh, sure, I'll give you a call. Well, I got the phone call, Don Iwerks and I went down there with another friend and we got to sit in the seat of the Spruce Goose. And there is a book written about the Spruce Goose. And there's a photo there of, of um, Howard Hughes at the controls. So I positioned the camera at the same angle as the as the original photo was taken of Fuse, and then printed that and did a collage of the Spruce Goose flying, a picture that somebody had flying over Long Beach or flying just off the water, and uh, a picture of Howard Hughes and a picture of, of, of Neil or whoever the guy was. And uh, then we arranged to send it over to his office. And um, he was, of course, thrilled with that. So the whole point of telling the story is that there is a, uh, there's so much to know about that airplane and the phenomenal work that it took to build it and engineer it. And I'm wondering if you know any, anybody who could put that together in a presentation because things like, again, being a pilot, they had to have, actually when they flew the plane, they had a engineer standing in the nacelle behind each motor because it was so large that the system, the control systems that they had prior to it were inadequate. They had to design pneumatic and hydraulic controls. And then even though it was made out of plywood uh, because they couldn't get materials at the time um, or Hughes had some deal going with plywood manufacturers, I don't know, but but anyway, there's a, a whole backstory about that airplane. And now it's, I, I think it's on exhibit someplace up in the Northwest. Yeah, it's so, up in, uh, where do they move it to? Um, oh, the company that was the, used to be a front for the CIA airline bought it and uh, it, it's up there. Bill, it's somewhere in Oregon, I think. Yeah, uh, McMinnville, I think it is. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. one but of our agents works there. But anyway, one of the cool things about the, again, I just called him kind of pretty, pretty gutsy, but 
we got to climb up in the plane and walk out on the in the wings and and uh, I I took some photos. Those are taken with my Hasselblad and they are film and I haven't scanned them. Otherwise, I would could easily send you that picture. Well, but yeah, it, all, it yeah, isn't amazing. All week, all week to scan and we'll be ready for you. Next. <laughs> I have to I have to go find it first. Anyway, I don't I'm not volunteering. I'm saying that I don't know enough about it. Although I found it really interesting. Uh, I actually worked for one of the probably the guy that in, that designed the pneumatic system uh, for the controls back in the day for Hughes. And so I'm always interested in uh, in that. And uh, Mitch Haston was his name. And uh, he was such a great, uh, a great guy to work for. And so um, I'm interested in learning more about it. There's a, I've got a, a couple of books that talk about the, you know, the story and trying to separate fact from fiction is, again, Howard Hughes was a larger than life character. Well, I'll talk to some of my aviation buddies and see if anybody can do it. I mean, the thing that's really interesting, you mentioned it flew, but it only basically flew in what we call ground effect. You know, right. where it had enough right. air built up underneath it to keep it up. But if he had tried to get it up much higher uh, other than that, I think it would have come right back down. So maybe, who knows, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was a fascinating story. Uh, Carol and I went to a, a show at the uh, Spruce Goose a number of years ago when it was still at the Dome and that Bob Hope is giving. And uh, it was just massive playing to sit under the wing of that thing. You know, and then we took the tour and, you know, well, we didn't get to go and sit in the seat like you. So it was fun, fun to see. It, it was just uh, just seeing how they got it through the city of Long Beach. You know, there's pictures I remember going again to the exhibit and showing how they got the pieces down the streets and over to where the dome was going to be and assembled it and uh, just amazing. Sort of like uh, moving the space shuttle. Yeah. yeah. A little, just like yeah. that. Yeah. Great. Well, appreciate oh. folks joining. Next week, I'm going to be taking a look at the 1964-65 uh, World's Fair at night. Um, a lot of people, uh, for myself included, the night was the favorite time at the fair. Um, it, first of all, New York got pretty hot and humid during the, the day and got very, very crowded. But at night, it cooled off. The best thing was everybody took their little kids home, so the lines went way, way down. Something that could have been a two and a half hour wait during the day became a 15 minute wait at night. But even better than that was all the lighting. Uh, they went way out of their way to uh, incorporate lighting into things like the carousel of progress with its swirling kaleidoscopic patterns, uh, the street lights, the uh, fountains, that sort of thing. So I'll be uh, starting with a quick tour around the fair at dusk, uh, getting darker and darker and going through it. And then we'll take a look at the uh, nightly fireworks show. So again, if uh, anybody's a fan of World Fairs, electric lights or fireworks, uh, please try to join me next week. But again, let's all give Beth a big round of applause. Appreciate the, uh, the effort. And, uh, Thank you very much, Beth. My husband's a trained that too, so he was very impressed. Oh, good. Well, thank you to Bill for the opportunity to, to do this. It was a, a good opportunity just to look at what we had and bring it all together. So uh, enjoy the, I enjoy attending these every week and enjoyed having the opportunity to put something together for this group. Oh, yeah. I enjoyed it. Like I said, Carol and I, our, our son went to school in Nashville and we had gone down taking several trips. And one time I realized we were not far all the way from Big Shanty. So just had to go over and, and take the tour and uh, really enjoyed it. And to me, I, again, you know, it, it sounds silly, but you're standing in the room of that thing and you realize people actually had the bravery to do what Andrews Raiders did. I mean, it's an a, amazing story what those guys did and, you know, the risk they took. And, uh, to you know, so glad that something like that just wasn't melted down to make Toyotas or something over the years. It's uh, anybody's ever in the area, I mean, you just go in there and there's an aura in that, that museum that is just, to a trained you know, historian like me, I really enjoyed it. And I hadn't seen like the, the Texas, I didn't know that was relatively close. So uh, when pandemic lifts, it gives me a, another reason for another field trip. So, well, thanks all. I hope everybody has a great weekend. And uh, again, if you're available to join next week, and uh, Jim Brown, you and I need to chat, uh, get together, see what we can do to, to get uh, something scheduled with our mutual friend. 
So appreciate everybody. And uh, we will uh, hopefully see some of you next week and hope you have a great week. Thanks all. Bye, Beth. Bye. Thanks, Beth. Great Thank job. You.